Well, good morning and welcome to Cross Community Church. Uh, if you're a guest today, I just want to say uh, welcome to Cross Community. And I wanted to take a minute and celebrate uh, what God is doing in our midst. Like every week, God is sending us new people. We have more people wanting to get into community, like people asking us, hey, where do I serve? Where do I get involved? And I just want to like praise you guys for uh, being faithful to offer yourselves to the Lord like in service to Him. Like That doesn't happen naturally. That's the work of God. And so just really thankful for what God is doing in our midst. Now, if you're new here and you don't know me, my name is Jason Waymeyer. I'm the lead pastor and one of the elders here at Cross Community. And uh, I got to tell you something about me. Um, I had a pretty illustrious wrestling career. I know, you can probably tell. You, you know, you're probably like, oh yeah, of course he did. Um, <clears throat> uh, I started in about the, the seventh grade. I was uh, uh, 82 pounds of fury. That's what I was. I was pretty tough. I, I want to give you just a, a quick shot of me. This is me in seventh grade when I started wrestling. I know, yeah, uh, pretty ferocious there. If you'll notice, this was shortly after I quit basketball. And the reason I quit basketball is because my coach wanted me to, all right? I was not very good. If you notice, I'm actually wearing basketball shoes. Uh, and this picture, uh, you might think, why is he standing so awkwardly? It's because I didn't know how to stand. I didn't have a wrestling stance. I'm just kind of uh, giving it my best right there. Now, uh, that picture is a little bit embarrassing to me. And uh, uh, I'll be honest with you, my first season in wrestling went about like you would expect that young man would do in wrestling. So Poto starts competitive school sports like 6th, 7th grade. Uh, this was 7th grade for me. And uh, other schools we were going to wrestle started in 1st. And I'll just be honest, I took a beating for years. Now, I did go to practice every day. Uh, I listened to my coach. I worked out with my teammates. Eighth grade, I had bulked up to 89 pounds. That was my weight class that I competed in, and so I was kind of getting beefy at that point. Ninth grade, I finally broke 100 pounds and five feet tall, and so I was really coming on. Uh, I didn't have my first winning season in wrestling until I was a sophomore. I uh, broke 500. I went 17 and 13, so just barely, but I made it, right? So things got better. Junior and senior year, I had a goal that I wanted to win a state championship in the state of Oklahoma, and I worked really, really hard toward that. I, I told you that uh, every day I went to practice, and, and when I was in practice, I didn't mess around. I worked really hard. I mean, it was like intense every single day. Um, if you don't know what wrestling practice is like, uh, we were in a small cinder block room with mats on the floor, and we would crank the heat up as hot as it could possibly get and and then go at it as hard as we could for three hours and so often would sweat off like four pounds in a single practice so every day I worked really hard when I got opportunities I was working out I ran cross country in the off season I did everything I could do to help me like work toward winning a state championship now this would be a much better story if I could tell you like this really triumphant thing where when I was a senior year, like as the seconds ticked down, like I won the state championship. Uh, but if I told you that, I'd be lying. I, I did not win. I qualified for state uh, my junior and senior year. And, and if I'm just really honest, I probably performed about as well as I could have. Uh, you know, I probably didn't have quite the talent that some of the other guys had or the experience. But when I look back on my wrestling career, honestly, I look back with like joy and, and gratitude. Um, I'm glad because what I know is that I pretty much performed to the best of my, my ability. Like the best, I finished the best finish I possibly could have had. Um, I don't look back and wish I would have worked harder because I worked hard. I don't look back and wish I would have not slacked or done other things. I pretty much put in all of what I could have hoped to have put in, and I got out of it pretty much everything I could have gotten out of it. Now, I, I tell you that story this morning because we've been walking through Philippians uh, where Paul's riding to the church there, and he's given them two examples of how we're supposed to live and conduct ourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. And the first example was that of Paul. 
And so the Apostle Paul, he's in prison in Rome, he's in chains, and he's like praising God that he gets the opportunity to share the gospel while in prison. He doesn't know if he's going to live or he's going to die. And so he's like, well, it doesn't matter. Whatever it means, as long as God is glorified in my body, whether by my life or my death, I'm in. For me to live is Christ. And that's a fairly weighty example, but he doesn't um, step down from there. The next example Paul gives us is Christ, who was God, who stepped down out of heaven. He took on flesh. He became a bondservant who was obedient even to the point of death on a cross. And so if you're a believer, it may be true that you feel a little bit like that seventh grade 82-pound wrestler. You're like, uh, I can't hang with that. Like, there's no way I can do any of that. Like, I'm, I'm never going to live a life worthy of the gospel. Certainly not like Jesus or Paul. But today, Paul, as he writes further in his letter to the church at Philippi, he's going to tell them how to be strengthened, how to begin to grow, and how to begin to mature in their faith, how to, how to put on some muscle, if you will, in terms of their faith, how to bulk up a little bit in their Christianity. He's going to teach them that what is normal, what ought to be expected in the life of every single believer is growth. And maturity, he's going to call them to greater levels of obedience that, that they wouldn't be the same yesterday as they are today or tomorrow as they are today or next year. Like we ought to look back and be like, man, I'm so glad that God is growing me. I'm not where I want to be yet, but I'm working toward this goal of Christ's likeness, of a life that's lived worthy of the gospel. And so Paul, he writes in Philippians chapter 2, beginning in verse 12, and he just remembers what God had begun among the Philippian believers. In verse 12, he says, So then, my beloved, my, my friends, my loved ones who are at Philippi, man, God did a thing in your midst. So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed. It's like, remember your beginning in the faith? To the jailer, do you remember what God did there? There was an earthquake, and you came to faith in Christ. You, you started becoming obedient to Jesus. You had a beginning in the faith, so he says, just as, as you always obey, not just in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Like the, the thing that ought to be happening in their lives, the things that he was urging them toward, is not that you just look back to a beginning in the faith where you were saved and you came to know Jesus Christ, but he's like, hey, today, in the here and now, much more more obey Jesus much more be growing in your faith and in your obedience to Christ like as the days go on we shouldn't stay where we once were where Christ began a good work in us but we ought to mature until that's completed uh, one day in our lives now I need to be really clear about something here on the front end so I'm going to take an aside all right as you look here in verse 12, and it says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, Paul is really clear to call this your salvation. In writing to the church at Philippi, he knew they were believers in Jesus Christ. So the question here is not whether or not they're saved. Paul knows they are saved. For if you're here today and you know Jesus Christ, you come to faith in him, I want you to know that your salvation was entirely the work of Jesus Christ on your behalf. I mean, we find ourselves, I don't know your story, Brandon shared his. his. His struggle was that of sexual sin and pornography. For me and my life, I spent years and years and years battling sexual sin myself, shame and guilt and trying to work through that. But it is Jesus Christ alone who found Brandon, who found me, and who found you. He found us in our sin. And God looked down from heaven, not with disgust at us because of our brokenness, not with a sense of condemnation, not wishing we'd get our act together. God looked down from heaven with compassion. He looked down out of heaven, and he, he responded with love. And in love, he sent his son Jesus to die the death that we deserved. Jesus Christ went to the cross for me, and my sin, and my brokenness, and my shame, my guilt. He lived a perfect, sinless life. The perfect man, Jesus, died for the imperfect man, Jason. The sinless for the sinful. 
There on the cross, God took every sin of mine, and it's true for you too if you've come to faith in Christ, and he placed it on his son Jesus, and Jesus endured the wrath that I deserved. And then God credited that perfect life of Jesus to me and to you if you've come to faith in him. What we believe is that salvation is entirely the work of God. We are saved by grace through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not by our works, so that none of us has reason to boast. There should be no arrogance in the church of Jesus Christ. We are sinners who have been saved by grace. Our salvation is accomplished by Jesus Christ alone, right? So what I'm not telling you today at any point in this sermon is that you need to work for your salvation, okay? You don't earn it. You don't deserve it. Jesus freely gives that to us. We don't work for our salvation, but we should work from our salvation. And so Paul, he writes to the believers in Philippi, and he's like, hey, remember how you began obeying? Remember when I was with you in the city of Philippi, and I got beaten with rods and thrown in prison, and you guys were encouraged to to be bold and to share the gospel and to live out your faith? He's like, just as you obeyed when I was there, now even more so in my absence, may you be encouraged to be obedient to Jesus Christ. And then he turns and he calls on them to work out their salvation with fear and trembling. Like there ought to be something happening in us where our faith is growing and being strengthened. This this word, work out, it's a really odd sound. In Greek word, it's it's katergadzamai. Um, It it has a couple of meanings. The, The first is the continuous, sustained, strenuous effort or pursuit. Continuous, sustained, strenuous effort or pursuit. This is not something that comes easily. Uh, I don't know how many of you have ever uh, New Year's resolution, like New Year rolls around, and you go get the, the gym membership, and you sign up for a year because it's cheaper, and then you use it for 14 days, and you never go back again because things came up over and over and over and over for 350 days the rest of the year. Things came up, and you didn't make it back to the gym. I've never done that either, by the way, just in case you're wondering. Uh, But if you ever have, uh, by the way, you can sign up for monthly. It's a little more expensive, but it's cheaper in the long run. If you're that kind of person, here's what we know, though. We don't get to work out for two weeks and see immediate results. Like, I mean, I'll be honest, when I've worked out for two weeks, I walk into the house and I'm like, Hey, babe, you know, you notice anything? How do I look? You know, I want her uh, to praise me and see it, but if she sees it, it's because she's lying. She's being nice to me, right? None of us believes that it's just a really quick momentary effort that's going to produce the results that we want, ultimately want to see. And so when we see this Greek word, my work out your salvation, you should see a long obedience here. You should see a long, strenuous, arduous pursuit, and we're pursuing The things from which other things result. That might be a little confusing to you, but catechismi, it means to do that from which something else results. It's kind of like you go and plant a seed one day that something might grow out, and one day you're going to reap the fruit of that seed. Um, Maybe it's like us in our working out. I don't know if we have any runners in in the house, but um, we have some runners in our church, and they're, they're those strange people that run miles and miles and miles. But the reason that we run isn't for the joy of running. If they tell you that there's a runner's high and somehow it's just joyful and I love to run, they're lying to make you feel bad about yourself, all right? It's not true. I've run lots and lots of miles. There's no such thing. Uh, We run because we want running, that exercise, to produce a result in us. We want to be healthy, right? We want our bodies to be in shape. We want to trim some fat, right? We do that from which something else results. And so when we catergasmi, we work out our salvation, what we're attempting to do is to make our salvation fruitful. Jesus Christ died, not so that we can like one day live with God in heaven. He, he died that we might experience and walk in the abundant life today, like fullness of life, fullness of joy today. And so we, my we work out our salvation. We do that from which something else results. We're looking forward to being matured. We're looking forward to further obedience, to becoming more like Jesus Christ and less like that person that we were before Jesus saved us. We're looking for progress, for growth, for maturity. 
And so Paul, he looks at him, he says, so then, my beloved, and men and women whom I suffered alongside of, who I offered myself for, I was beaten there, I was imprisoned there, and don't stop where you are. Don't settle for merely being on God's team. I'm saved. I'm on the team. He's like, no, no, no. You have a race to run. Paul would tell us that we are God's workmanship. And let me say this about you. You are God's workmanship. You were created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared in advance for you to walk in those things. So he's like, hey, don't, don't just settle for being on the team. And don't settle for your beginning in the faith. May you be built up and strengthened. May you be matured as a man or a woman of God. That you might be uh, someone who God is able to use and to work through because you've offered yourself to him. Let me, let me say it this way. I don't believe for a second that God is done with you. That God has a hope ahead of you. God has works he wants to do in you. He wants to heal that which is broken. He wants to strengthen that which is weak, but he wants to do it in him. And then he wants to work through you in the world. Like your marriage might feel hopeless about right now, but God isn't finished. He wants to keep doing work. Like you might find yourself right now feeling hopeless in the midst of an addiction and like pain or sin that you can't get rid of, but God isn't done. He's got more work he wants to do in you and ultimately through you because maybe there's someone in your life and in your circle who's hurting and God wants to use you to be the one that brings light into the midst of their darkness, hope in the midst of their hopelessness. God is not done. Don't stop where you are, but instead may you start this continuous, strenuous striving day after day after day, pursuing the things from which something good is going to result. What we're looking for is for the fruit of our salvation to be birthed in our lives. So we have Jesus. He died on the cross for us. He went to the grave and he arose three days later. And as Jesus ascended into heaven, he would send his Holy Spirit to live within the hearts of everyone who would come to faith in him. The Holy Spirit of God lives within you. You know what the fruit of the Spirit is? Love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. God is trying to birth those things in your life. He wants you to live a life of love, of joy, of peace, of patience. And sometimes we get into this habit of, hey, God, I need patience. Would you give me patience? He's like, you've got patience in the person of the Holy Spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. He's in you already. You've got to work that out in your life. You've got to start practicing obedience in the day after day after day in your strenuous effort that you do the things from which something else Results, you catergasmai, you work out your salvation. You are a child of God. You have riches in Him. So Paul says, get busy about the work. Seek after Jesus Christ. Give yourself to the things that give your heart to Jesus. Pursue God in His Word. And in prayer, walk in community with other believers. Gather consistently with the body of Jesus Christ. Offer yourself in service to other people as Jesus Christ did. Give sacrificially as Jesus Christ is given to you. Offer yourself to share the gospel even when it's hard and inconvenient and you're terrified. Share the gospel with people that need to hear it and watch what God is going to do through you. You give yourself to those things which will give your heart to Jesus. If you're here today and you're like, oh, Jason, I thought you told us we weren't supposed to work. That's not what I said at all. You shouldn't work for your salvation. You should work from your salvation that you might be rooted and strengthened and built up in the word and in the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. We should work really hard. But then Paul's going to tell us kind of the attitude that we have. When we work, when we catergasm, I work out our salvation. Here's the attitude we're supposed to have. He says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Now, this is one of those passages that I'm just going to be honest. For most of my life, every time I saw, like, the fear of the Lord, I'm like, I'm not afraid of God. I feel like God loves me. Jesus died for me. Why would I be afraid of God? This is a strange way to phrase this. Well, 
The Greek word here for fear, uh, you probably recognize it. It's phobos. It's where we get our modern day word for phobia. Now, what Paul is not telling us to do is to be afraid of God, but rather to have this reverential awe of God. That means recognizing how big God is. God is perfect in all of his ways. He's all-knowing. He's all-powerful. He can do anything at any time. He spoke creation into existence. Like, God is really, really big. He's really, really loving and just. And and all of his ways are perfect. And then, like, we look at ourselves, and I'm like, I'm not really perfect. I've grown a little bit beyond 82 pounds, 7th grade Jason, but I'm still just as weak. I still got the same weaknesses and insecurities and brokenness. Like, God's growing me. I'm maturing, but I got nothing on God. And so when we have this reverential awe of God, recognizing His bigness and our own smallness, what we do is we respond in humble submission to Him. It's not, hey, God, I know what your word says, but I'm going to do differently. It's, listen. I'm a sinful, broken person apart from the work of Jesus Christ in my life. So I'm going to submit my life to him. I know how it goes when I go my own way. I've seen the fruits of following my own fleshly desires. I'm going to follow Jesus. So Paul says, work out your salvation with fear. And there's another really important word here. Trembling. It's the Greek word traumas. And it's used to describe the anxiety of one who distrusts his ability completely to meet all the requirements, but religiously does his utmost to fulfill his duty. Here's what this looks like. When you're working out your salvation, you need to know that it's not going to depend upon you. Like you could never produce transformation in your own heart. You could never produce the fruit that you want to see. But you're going to give yourself, you're going to be like, God, I'm going to be here. I'm going to seek after you and I'm asking you to do the work. It's a recognition that we cannot do it. Like God is the one who has to work in us. Jesus said, I'm the vine, you're the branch. He who abides in me and I in him, man, that branch is going to bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. So when we think about working out our salvation, and we, we want to give it our effort. We want to seek after Jesus Christ, but we, all, we do so with the very clear knowledge that we can't do it on our own, that we need God to work on our behalf. And so here's what Paul does. He's like, to make this a little more clear for you, you should work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And then verse 13, 4, it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work according to his purpose. Like every single desire that you have to seek after God, like to pursue him in any meaningful way, That actually originated with God. That was the Holy Spirit prompting you and drawing you. Like Jesus is the one who saved us. He's the author of our faith. He wrote that story. He did the work. But guess what? He's also the perfecter of our faith who's drawing us unto him that we might know him and experience what true life is like in him, that we would forsake the things of this world and follow after Jesus with all of our hearts. And God's at work there. He's the one who's encouraging you. He's like cheering you on when you have the desire desire to open up the Word. You're like, I think I need to get in the Word. The Spirit's like, yes, open up the Word. Like that desire originated with me. He's like cheering you on, like do this thing from which good fruit is ultimately going to result. Like this is life-changing stuff. As a matter of fact, if you're here this morning, and maybe you haven't been here ever, or maybe it's been a really long time, and you think this is the Sunday that you just happened, all the stars aligned, you got up early enough, and you found your way into this place, I want you to know that that wasn't of you. That was the Holy Spirit of God drawing you together with the body of Christ. It wasn't just your friend asked you so many times you didn't want to disappoint them anymore. That was the Holy Spirit of God who was drawing you to this moment. He is at work in you to will and to work according to his purpose. You are God's workmanship. You were created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God has marked out for you in advance. No one is more invested in you living the abundant life here on earth and ultimately in eternity to come than Jesus Christ. He's drawing you to his goodness, to his grace, to his mercy, to knowing him. So Paul, 
writing to his beloved friends in Philippi. God's not done with you. And don't, don't settle for just being on a team. And get out there and allow God to work through you. Watch what God will do in you and through you as you work out your salvation. You seek that salvation might bear fruit in your life. You give yourself to the things that will give your heart to God. And all along the way, the Holy Spirit of God, he's working in you to will and to work according to his purpose. I've talked to uh, people over the years that when they think about God, they're really disappointed in them. I'm like, man, I just don't have any desire to seek God in his word. And I just, I don't know, I don't, I don't want to pray, and I don't seem to desire the same things that other, other people do. Well, here's the thing. Um, when you're 82 pounds, 7th grade, beginning wrestler, you don't win a lot of matches. Matter of fact, um, every day I wanted to quit because I got beat up on, and that's really harmful to a 7th grader's pride, you know. Uh, but every day I went to practice. And day by day, I got a little stronger, built up a little more endurance. I learned a little more of the technique. Week by week, I got a little bit better, a little bit better, a little bit better, and I started to win. Not all that often, I'll be honest, but started to win a little bit more. And the more victory I experienced, the more that I, I wanted to pour into practice, that I might get to, to win some more and experience more victory in my life. Here's the thing. Paul was like, you need to do the things from which something else is going to result, and you're going to have to work hard for this. There is this union of your work and God's work that takes place in you. D.A. Carson, he's kind of a, a noted theologian, he calls this grace-driven effort, where God's like, hey, work out your salvation. He, the Spirit initiates this in you, and you're like, okay, I'm going to work really hard. It's going to be ongoing. It's going to be strenuous. It's going to be difficult. The enemy is going to oppose me, but I'm going to do it. But let me warn you about something. There are two voices present, present in your life at every single moment. Paul talks about this in Galatians. There is the voice of the Spirit of God, which will be drawing you unto Christ's likeness, and wants to lead you on the path to abundant life, fullness of joy. But there's also the voice of your flesh. It says, you do you. And think about you and yours. And don't be serving people. And you just take care of you. Let other people serve you. Don't be giving your money away. You worked hard for that. You should enjoy it, right? Listen, you don't want to upset people sharing the gospel. If you'll just hang back, don't worry about it. You don't have time to spend in the Word. Two voices present in your life. The voice of your flesh and the voice of your spirit. And Paul says this in Galatians chapter 6. He says, do not be misled. Church, get this right. Do not be misled. God will not be mocked. Whatever a man sows, that's what's, what, what he's going to reap. If you sow to please your flesh, I'm going to go pursue pleasure, the things that my flesh desires, whatever that might be. He says, from the flesh, you're going to reap destruction. But if you'll sow to please the Spirit, it is from the Spirit you're going to reap eternal life, those good spiritual benefits of the uh, abundance of life that's available to us in Christ Jesus. And so uh, in working out our salvation, we give ourselves the things that are going to give our hearts to Jesus. Here at Cross Community Church, um, we ask every single one of our members to covenant together, like we are, we're in it together, like we're going to do this. We're, we're on the team, but we're going to be the team, right? We're actually going to play in this game. We're going to be disciples of Jesus Christ. We're not just content to be like, I'm saved and now I'm good. But instead, we recognize that Jesus has good works for us. And so one of the things we covenant to do together is to pursue the six practices of a disciple. Now, note I said pursue. All right, we're not perfect from the beginning. We're never going to be perfect, but we're going to chase after becoming like Christ. And so in the six practices of a disciple, we ask people to devote daily. And every single day you, you get up, you spend time communing with God in prayer and in His Word. We ask people to gather with the body of Christ consistently, like this is an ongoing part of your life. We ask people to commit to community, to walk through life with other people that we could strive together with them. It's where we confess our sins one to another and pray for each other that we might be healed. It's where we help each other in times of, of struggle. 
We, we offer biblical counsel to one another. We do life together. We submit ourselves to each other. The fourth thing we ask people to do here is to serve faithfully. Remember the example of Jesus? A bond slave, obedient unto death, even death on a cross. It doesn't bother me one bit to ask you to serve this body using the gifts God's given you. That's what God's called you to do. We ask people to give sacrificially as Christ has given unto you. We ask people to engage missionally. That means we take the gospel with us out of here. We don't keep it for ourselves. We enter into the discomfort, the anxiety of sharing something that's difficult to share with people. But we do all of these things. These six practices, we're just hoping that something else results out of them. We pursue these six practices together because we want to live out the abundant life available to us in Christ Jesus. It's not about the six practices. Some people are like, hey, isn't that legalism to like ask all your people to do this? Or that? I'm like, no. No, it's not legalism. Like legalism is when you're trying to do something to earn something from God. We've already been given salvation from God. Now we're going to pursue all of the benefits available to us in Christ Jesus. Not just benefits for us, right? Because there are personal benefits but also benefits to the world around us. Y'all, we live in a world that desperately needs Jesus. We are the light in the darkness. And so we give ourselves to the things that give our heart to Jesus in hope that God will continue his work in us, that obedience would be grown in us, birthed in us, will become like Christ, and that fruit will be born through us in this world. Look what Paul says here in verse 14. For believers who kind of check the box, I'm on the team, I've come to faith in Christ, they don't grow, they don't mature, they aren't working out their salvation, they just stay as they are. You know what inevitably happens over time? Because God has way more in store for you, but you're not living in that. You're not constantly walking with Christ through whatever this world throws at you. What very often happens is people become bitter. I've been in churches full of people. All they wanted to do was grumble and complain, dispute. Anytime the pastor would ask them to do anything that make them the slightest bit uncomfortable, they're angry, right? They're upset. They want to argue. No, 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 don't, don't ask me to do that. One of the things we're committed to do is we'll never ask you to do anything here at Cross Community that Christ Jesus hasn't already asked you to do. Like, we're going to preach the word, and we're going to call you to full faithfulness in that. But churches, supposed to be light in the darkness, are often full of people who, everywhere they go, grumbling and complaining. Sometimes we do that about our culture and the world that we live in. We're believers who have been radically saved out of darkness who then turn around and gripe about the darkness all the time. Like, no, 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 we don't gripe about the darkness. We enter in to the darkness. We bring light to that darkness. And so Paul's like, no, 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 this complaining, this disputing, grumbling, complaining about everything that goes on, that is not fitting for the people of God. We've been transformed. Here's what ought to be happening. He says, do all things without grumbling or disputing so that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent, children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. We don't complain about the crooked and perverse verse, generation, we exist, he says here, as lights in the world among whom you appear. Like, that's our role. That's what we're supposed to be as the people of God. Every day being conformed to the image of Christ, working out our salvation, being transformed, not complaining, not grumbling, not being a, a, a pain in our, our home and, and, and causing dissension there or in our family or our workplace, but instead we do everything without grumbling or complaining. And God is conforming us to the image of Christ. He didn't consider equality with God something to be grasped, but he humbled himself, obedient even unto death on a cross. In the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you appear as lights, and calls us to hold fast, in verse 16, the word of life. We cling to the word of life. This is the gospel of Jesus. We cling to Jesus Christ in the good and the bad and the ugly, in those difficult seasons when the political winds blow our way and when they don't, when we get the promotion and when we don't, when we're healthy and when we're sick, we hold fast the word of life, the gospel of Jesus Christ, consistently fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, that we might run this race with perseverance, that he might accomplish all of his work in us. 
He says, so that in the day of Christ, I will have reason to glory because I did not run or toil in vain. Wouldn't it be a shame if the people of God had all the inheritance that's been given us in Christ Jesus? The fruit of the Spirit, man, it's there. It's at our fingertips. And we have fullness of life. We've had good works that God has laid out for us. We've been empowered and equipped to, to walk in those good works, but instead we just decided not to. got caught up in our hobbies or making a bunch of money, pursuing comfort and pleasure. And we look back on our life and wish we would have shared the gospel with that person. We wish we would have given to the person in need, served the person who needed to be served. There will be a day where your entire life is put into perspective for you, where you'll look back and you'll know, did I, did I live this life in vain? Or did I work out my salvation? Did I grow and mature each and every day? Did I see God accomplish things in me that I never could have imagined? Paul says, even if I'm being poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I will rejoice and share my joy with you. And you too, I urge you, rejoice in the same way and share your joy with me. Paul's looking forward to one day when they're going to be reunited. And this is like the high fives after the game. Looking back, like, man, we did it together. And we didn't run in vain. And look what God has done. And look around you at the people that have come to faith in Christ because you gave and because you served, because you chose to seek the word of God instead of watching Sports Center at night or whatever the other things we could have done, right? You chose to invest in the things that were going to produce a return in your life. You worked out your salvation and you grow, you grew and you matured, and God did things you cannot even imagine through you. Paul's like, man, I want to celebrate, I want to rejoice with you. We're high fiving as we see all that God has done. In and through us. God has called us to be the church in Poto and Bacola and whatever city you might live in. You are the light in the darkness. We are the light in the darkness. And we get busy working out our salvation, growing and maturing in Christ Jesus, that we might not run a race in vain, and that one day we might look back and rejoice. Would you bow with me? Father, we do praise you for your good work in us. God, uh, there's not one of us that stands here hoping upon our own ability. Lord, that's empty. There's no way we can earn our way to you. But God, you've given salvation to us as a free gift. Now, Lord, I pray that we would work from that salvation and live lives worthy of the gospel, that we would be lights in the midst of darkness, the people who bring you honor and glory with our lives who grow and mature each and every day, who are conformed to your image. God, may you use us. People who might feel like 7th grade, 82-pound nothings. But God, through the power of your Spirit, you use us to accomplish things beyond our own comprehension or understanding. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.